in a culture of diminishing Christian influence, I believe it's still the case that from time to time we can hear in common speech what we would identify as Christians, Bible expressions. And so, for instance, sometimes, if we listen carefully, we can hear people use the terms like, he's the prodigal of our family. And we're hoping he'll return, but at the moment, he's off, rebelling. Where did the term prodigal come from? Well, of course, it came from the Bible. And it would seem to me that out of all the parables that Jesus told, it is the parable of the prodigal son that is perhaps the most widely known. Maybe one reason why the expression prodigal has stuck still in even in our day, and even with a vague idea of the story still lingering, perhaps a reason for that is because people can relate to this story. This story that Jesus told really does connect to our lives. It connects in many of our cases to our own families. And to some degree or another, every one of us here this afternoon are like the prodigal in this famous story that Jesus told. Well, the tale begins Luke 15 and at verse 11 where Jesus says, or Luke introduces Jesus and he says, then he, that is Jesus, said, and then he quotes Jesus, a certain man had two sons. You see, this is effectively a story about a normal first century family in Palestine. If you took a photo of this family on this day of verse 11, posted on social media, everyone would see what looked like a happy, harmonious family, a perfect family of Palestine, just like yours, right? Wrong. See how immediately the lid is lifted on the perfect post of a family in verse 12. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a fair, far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. The first thing we see in this story, as the lid is lifted to the reality of this family, the first of two things I want to draw your attention to tonight is the prodigal's rebellion. The prodigal's rebellion. You see, this son, he had the whole of life before him. Everything that he needed was there on the family farm. But he wasn't content. He wanted to run his own life. He refused any longer to submit to a loving father. He wanted his freedom. And so... He demanded his inheritance early. Listen to how he speaks. This is a father talking to a son, first century Palestine. Listen to what he says at the end of verse 12. Father, give me the portion of goods that falls me. Can you hear how demanding he is of his father? Can you hear how disrespectful he was? toward his father. Not only that, according to their custom, 
He would receive his portion of the inheritance, but he would have to wait until after his father's death. But he couldn't wait. You see, he possessed such a hard-hearted defiance toward his caring father, he actually himself didn't care what disruption his demand would bring to his father and the farm. He didn't care what hurt that this was going to create. I just want my cash, Dad, and I want it now. You see, so rebellious was this demand that it was actually not uncommon in that time that this type of thing was seen as such a serious breach that the family may literally hold a funeral for such a son due to his insolent behaviour. And, and you see, from this day forward, he would then be regarded as good as dead. And of course, Jesus' original hearers in the first century Palestine, where this story is set, they knew that this indeed was horrible rebellion being played out in the first part of this story. And yet, friends, the thing that we must see at the outset here is that in this story, the father stands for God, and this youngest son, the prodigal, he stands for you and me as sinners. This is how you and I actually have treated God, the heavenly Father. The Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have rebelled against the God who supplies us with everything we have in life. Think of that personally. He has showered you with so much in your life. Not one of those things you deserve. Not one of those things is your right to have. They are gifts from the Father of light. The Heavenly Father's love is real in your life. His care has been active in your life. But you see, in our rebellion, like in this story, we actually disdain the Father's heavenly love. We're like this prodigal. We reject his authority over us because we want to run our own lives, don't we? It's exactly what Isaiah says when he says in Isaiah 53 and verse 6 that all we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned, every one of us, he says, to our own way. It's rebellion. Verse 13 then shows us, after the demand, what, what of course happens. It tells us in verse 13 that he journeyed to a far country. And so you see, he didn't just leave father. He didn't just leave behind the farm. He actually, we would say, left the faith of his youth. The prodigal was a Jew. He was raised in a God-fearing home. But he didn't want God in his life. He wanted to get away from all of that. So where did he go? He went to a far country. In other words, he wanted to go as far away as possible from everyone that he knew. He didn't want them watching him. He didn't want them to uh, see him indulge in his sinful behavior. He wanted to live an unrestrained life. He wanted his freedom. He didn't want the restrictions that come from living at home. He didn't want the limitations of God's law. And so where did he go? He went to a far country. He wanted to get away from the land of Israel. He wanted to go to some Gentile country, some far away place. Lord Nelson, many of you probably have heard of him, the famous English sea captain, he once said, that every sailor is a bachelor when beyond Gibraltar. I'll say it again, I'm quoting him. Every sailor is a bachelor when beyond Gibraltar. 
You see, Nelson knew that once his sailors sailed past or beyond the bounds or the region of the British Empire, beyond the society's scheme of morality and accountability, once those sailors got those ships past that point down near Spain and away from the influence of the the British Empire, once they were away from the watchful eye of home, they were like bachelors. They sought to live according to their own pleasure. Every man became a bachelor. You read the life of John Newton. You see a vivid portrayal of a man who was a gentleman at home. But when he was away, he was vulgar. He was abusive. And isn't that the nature of sin? We sin. And we don't want anyone to know. Or we might want to run away so that we can sin. We go in search of our own far off country. Jesus says in John 3, really explaining some of these things, he says men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. What's the issue? Well, again, he says, he goes on and Jesus says, everyone practicing practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds be exposed. And so the prodigal doesn't want to be exposed. The prodigal is running off to the far country to get away so that he can indulge in his sinful passions. He's running Can you relate to that? Have you been running? Maybe you haven't been running yet, but maybe for some of you, it's actually your secret plan. It's a plan that you're plotting in your own mind of what you want to do in the future. You want to get away from the restraints of your home, perhaps. You want to indulge your passions. You're wanting your so-called freedom. But as we'll see even in this story, it's not freedom at all. Where does this rebellion take us every time? Well, where did it take the prodigal? Have a look back at the story, end of verse 13, where Jesus says, in the far country, what did he do? There he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. Now that word prodigal, it simply means it's the idea to squander, to waste, to live in excess. And so this was self-indulgence that he was engaging in with godless Gentiles. There's an idea that's packaged up in this, in this concept and as we see it unfold in the story, it speaks of immorality. This was party living with worldly friends, so-called. He wanted the rush of sinful passions. I think you know what I mean when I use that expression, rush. But it wasn't freedom he was getting. He was bondage. You see, this is actually the pathway to addiction, not freedom. And there's every indication as we look at this story that the so-called friends of the prodigal in the far country, they only took him deeper and deeper into their murky ways. There's a lesson here, young people, not so young even. Those you choose as your friends, you will become like them. Is that what you want? These so-called friends in this story only took the prodigal further into the muck of sin in the world's far country. You see, this is what sin does. It takes us down. It promises us pleasure. It promises some uplifting thing, but it delivers nothing lasting of that sort at all. 
And as we think of this story, this is a first century story, right? This is like so long ago, but if we could bring this into a modern scene of a young man in a far off country engaging in prodigal living in our, in our time, this would be something of the scene of drinking parties and of drugs, of soft drugs, hard drugs. This is the lifestyle of clubbing, of, of seductive par- uh, uh, behaviour, of partying, of perverse living, of loose women. That's this type of thing. It's looking for the next thrill that you can get from some substance, some experience, or some new partner or friendship. And it does seem, from what the brother, the older brother later says in this story, that the prodigal was entangled with immoral women. In verse 30, he says, Dad, my younger brother has devoured your livelihood with prostitutes. He has wasted your inheritance on harlots. See what Jesus says in verse 13. Let's look at the language carefully. He says he wasted his possessions. He wasted. That was his life. Wasted. What, what, what is it that... We call this guy like what? He doesn't actually have a proper name. Like, we don't know his proper name. It's not given. How do we know him? What do we know him by? He's simply known as the prodigal son. He's simply known as the wasted son. This is always the path of sin, it always leads to the wasted. Wasted years, wasted youth, wasted life. That's what happens. Is that your story? I mean, this is his story, but is this your story? Have you spent years wasting your life on things that never satisfy you, that never bring you liberty, but only bind you? How much have you wasted in life? Think of that. How much money, just think of money, how much money have you wasted on sinful things? Things that are not wholesome and righteous and good for us. Many people trash their health and they never ever can get it back again. Wasted away. Pursuing this life and they end up exhausted. Emotionally exhausted. Wasted. And so I want to say, young people, not so young people, don't choose the prodigal's path of rebellion because if you do, you will waste your life. You could even waste your soul. The prodigal's life, according to the language of Jesus, is a wasted life. And indeed, it was a scarred life. There were things that he did in that far country that we might say scarred him for life. That's what happens to any of us when we yield to sin. And so I'm speaking this way directly out of love that you don't get scarred. Even if you're a professed believer, this this is still sin's nature. It lures you and it will leave you wasted and scarred. Well, in our story, things only go from bad to worse for the prodigal. You see, life wasn't actually on the up at all. It was definitely on the down. As the story goes, come with me back to the passage, verse 14 It says, but when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. And so the the initial excitement was very temporary, wasn't it? All his cash, gone. All his so-called friends have suddenly vanished. 
Proverbs 13 and verse 15 says, The way of the sinner is hard. If we just now just pause at this point in the story and just take a long look at the prodigal in the far country here. He's out of cash. He's out of friends. He's out of food. And then add to this, suddenly there's a severe famine that comes upon the land. And remember this is first century Palestine. And so put all of those things together and this was huge. There is no so social security safety net under you if you lived in that century, in that place. We know he's got no network of support with family. He's left all them behind. He has no network of support for friends. They've all vanished and left him there. He is living, you see, a real nightmare. You see now where his rebellion has taken him? He was at what we might call a dead end. And I say that because death was the only thing left in front of him. In his desperation though, and he is in a desperate place. In his desperation, I want you to see what he tries to do. He tries to pull himself out of the hole that he himself had dug for himself. In other words, he tries to save himself. Have a look at verse 15. Then, when all this is going on, then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Now remember, he's a Jew. To feed and to live with pigs was to sink as low as you could go in life if you're a Jew. And again, friends, I draw your attention to this same issue. That is the very direction that sin always takes us. Down lower and lower and lower. And it is Satan's aim. Satan aims to tempt us, to get us into that place. He aims to take every one of us into the pit itself, to the depth of the worst that there is. That's his aim. Of course, we sometimes can kid ourselves and, and, and we can think that it's okay for us just to play around with sin a little bit. I mean, I'll be okay. <laughs> I, I, I just want to have a little fling with drugs. I just want to flirt a little with pornography or with women. I just want to experiment a little with drink. I only want a little bit of indulgence. Sin always takes us down. It will take us even to that place like this story to live in the mud with the pigs. What is being put to us here is that there is nothing clean, there is nothing decent or noble about sin. Nothing. Yet still, see what the prodigal is up to in his heartache. He is still trying to invent a way to escape his crisis and avoid having to own up fully to the real problem that he has and what he actually did really need to do. What does he do? He joins himself to a Gentile citizen. And then verse 16 says, And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. He ends up looking at what the pigs ate and he looks at their food with envy. He is hungry all the time as the original implies the pigs. They ate what was called carob pods, that which had virtual zero nutrients for a human. In other words, the pigs were better off than he was. You see where sin took him? No money, 
No friends, no comfort, no dignity, no food. The end of verse 16. No one gave him anything. No one. No one there who could help him. No one there who certainly would help him. Nothing in the world was of any good to him and he couldn't even help himself. Jesus wants us to learn a vital lesson here. Put no confidence in man. Put no confidence in any person. Not even yourself. Here's this guy, he went chasing after pleasure. He went pursuing freedom and it turned out to be the exact opposite. The sinner's hard road leads to ruin. Proverbs 14 and verse 12. This is one of those texts that everyone should know. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Here he is, all his attempts to resolve his problems by himself failed. What a powerful lesson there is here for us, friends. And yet you know the tendency of your own heart. You know the tendency of others as you watch. So many try to solve their sin-produced problems themselves. They run here and they run there. They try something new. Maybe they take up a new sport to distract them. Maybe they think getting a new job will do it. Turn over a new leaf. Take some up, some different therapy, a new distraction. Seek help from some professional, maybe a counsellor. Go to a priest. But it never works. There is a way that seems right to a man. But its end is the way of death. We see then firstly from our story the prodigal's rebellion and now secondly the prodigal's repentance. As we come into verse 17, verse 17 is where it all changes. Verse 17, there's a turning, there's a change. It starts, doesn't it? But, but when he came to himself, Jesus uses this expression, he came to himself. That means he came to his senses. He woke up. Before this, before verse 17, in the part of the story before this, it was like he was unconscious to his true condition. It was like he was blind to his stupidity. Blind to his rebellion. Now I want you to think about this, friends. And I want you to notice that when Jesus is telling this story in verse 17, Jesus didn't say when he came to the end of his resources. Jesus said he came to himself. There are plenty of people who come to the end of their resources, but they never come to themselves. They never come to their senses. They never wake up to their real problem. They never actually wake up and see what is actually the main thing broken. Many come to the end of their resources and they despair. And so they turn to drink to try and wash it away. They turn to drugs to try and blind themselves to the reality of the pain and the hurt in their lives. And of course, sadly, many even commit a, a suicide in this time of despair when they've come to the end of their resources. But coming to the end of their resources, that isn't the same as coming to your senses and turning to God. You see what is said here in verse 17. Let's go back and read the verse. It says, but when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I, what's his realization about himself now that he's come to his senses? I 
perish with hunger. I'm about to perish. I'm in a state where I need saving. He's woken up to the fact that he's been a fool. And all that I have before me is to perish. You see, finally he stopped running. Finally he looked honestly at himself for the first time. As I've said to some of you privately, I'm convinced that that is one of the hardest things for every one of us to do. And that is to look at ourselves honestly. Have you done that? It's easy to get busy in life and distract ourselves so that we don't look at ourselves honestly. So much of that is our culture filled with entertainment, filled with this, filled with that, so that people won't stop and think about how serious things are for themselves. Here's this guy. He's alone. He's full of guilt. He's broken. And finally, he had an accurate assessment of his own condition. Friend, do you have that? I hope you do. Because hope begins when you come to an accurate knowledge of your state before God. That you, you have broken God's law. That you are full of guilt. That your rebellion has and it will only ever bring you ruin. That your current destiny is to perish. In verse 17, the prodigal looked at himself in the mirror of God's word. And he saw who God says he was. Have you done that? You know, friends, he didn't just see the consequences of his own stupid sins. That's one thing. He owned his sin. Sins committed against God. That's what he says. Look at verse 18. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against God. Jews wouldn't use the word God. They substitute it for the word heaven. I have sinned against God and before you. I want you to see the order of those two things. His primary concern was that he had sinned against God. I have sinned against heaven. I have broken his law. I have offended God. I have broken that relationship between me and God. Yes, he knew that his sin had brought much sorrow into his own life. He knew that his sin had brought sorrow into his family. But that was not his chief burden. It was that he knew that he was guilty before a holy God and that he was destined to perish. He saw his sin before a holy God. He came to understand in the language of the Bible that the wages or the payment of sin is death. That I have broken God's law and I stand condemned before heaven's judgment and therefore I desperately need God to forgive me of my sins. That is my greatest need. That is my first and foremost need. I've sinned against heaven and I need heaven to forgive me. I believe the prodigal was really experiencing a true sense of guilt and personal conviction of sin that perhaps comes out in verse 19. Where further he's going on and he's rehearsing what he's going to say when he gets back to the farm. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I am no longer worthy. He knew he had no rights before God. 
He knew that he couldn't just front up to his father as if nothing was wrong. He knew that he couldn't go back to that farm and think that somehow he was just entitled to it all again. He felt unworthy. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He was humbled. He was ashamed of his sin. You see where it left him? It left him in a sense of, a true sense of uncleanness, a true sense of unworthiness. Now, it's not all he said, but it's the first thing he said. And I want you also just very quickly to notice in passing that his intention was not just to confess his sins to God, but his intention also was to confess his sins to his family because he had sinned not just against God, he had sinned against his family. And so he knew that he needed to go back to his family. He needed to own those sins he needed to confess those sins to the ones that he'd sinned against and he need to, uh, needed to ask them for their forgiveness. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. But friends, there's also one other thing I want you to see here. There's something else that he realised that was the thing I would suggest to you more than anything else that moved him to get up out of that mud in the pigsty. It comes through back in the words in verse 17. When he says, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. He understood the nature, not just of his own sin, he understood the nature of his father. There is plenty in my father's house. There is a super abundant provision in my father's house. Here I am, I'm famishing. Here I am, I'm in a mess. Here I am, I'm perishing in my murky sins. But I can see it now. The sinner... The sinner without God, he perishes in sin, perishing now. Yes, perishing in eternity. I am destitute in my sins. Yes, that's me. But look at my father. My father. Look at him. He's full of grace. He's full of abundant grace. What's the language? There is bread enough in my father's house and to spare. And so you see, he seems to be reasoning. If the lowest of the servants in my father's house has enough, more than they could ever need, then surely the worst of sinners can find all the grace needed in God. An abundant supply of grace, therefore, is available for me. Here's the sinner's true hope. You see, it's not just this looking honestly at my sin. If that's all it was, that's a miserable place to be. But it's turning to see God's free grace that there is actually available for me a super abundant supply of God's undeserved favour, His forgiving grace. Grace, grace, grace greater than all my sins. You see the prodigal's precise words there in verse 17. How many of my father's servants have bread enough and to spare. So there is more grace in God to forgive than there are sins in me and even sins in every sinner on the planet. Our sins, they are many, but his mercy is more. What happens next in the story is crucial. 
Look at verse 20, and this is as far as we're going to go tonight. We'll come back next time and take up this story a bit more. But look at verse 20. This is crucial. And he arose and came to his father. Proverbs 28 and verse 13 says, Whoever conceals his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. It wasn't enough for the prodigal to acknowledge his sin and even to recognize grace in his father's heart. The prodigal had to get up out of the mud. He had to leave that far country. He needed to walk away from his sins. He had to do an about face if he was ever going to go to the Father. And so what does Jesus say in verse 20? He arose and he came to his Father. It's clear in the far country, the prodigal thought. He thought very deeply. He took the time to think deeply. We might say there was more than just thinking. There was weeping. There was feeling. But thinking. Weeping. Feeling. Isn't enough. He must repent. And I want to say we are glad that some of you are here. Really, really glad. And we are glad that you are thoughtful about these things. And glad that you are taking the time to think deeply. And we're glad that even to some degree some of you are moved by these things. But in the end, that's not enough. You must get out of the muck of your sin and you must turn to God for salvation. Never ever forget Judas. He realized he sinned. He wept over his sin. But he never ever repented of his sin. The prodigal, he arose and he came to his father. My friend, I want you to understand that Jesus is a willing and he is an able saviour. Regardless of what might be in your past. Yes, he can even deliver you from the bondage to sin tonight, but you must leave your sin. The prodigal in our story, he went to his father just as he was. He, he didn't try and clean up his life as if somehow that would make him more acceptable. No, he went to his father as he was. Mud was still clinging to him. The stench of the pigsty still in his clothes, probably still in his hair. He arose and came to his father. He went as he was. And that is how God receives sinners coming just as we are. Coming in repentance. Coming, confessing, confessing our sins to him. But also trusting in God's abundant grace to forgive us and to actually receive us. That's salvation, friends. That's a message worth shouting about. As a Jew, he could have ran to the temple. As a Jew, he could have gone to try and find a priest, but he doesn't. He went to his father confessing his sins, seeking forgiveness. He went hopeful. He went trusting in, his, in this gracious provision of salvation. Now, it could very well be that I'm speaking to some and, and, and you feel like that's you. You've been in the world, you've done it all, and this is a message from heaven for you tonight and you need to listen and you need to respond. I'd urge you to respond tonight. But it would seem to me that most in this chapel tonight are not like that. 
You, you may not be in the far country of worldliness tonight. In fact, you may have lived a very respectable life. Outwardly, people would not say of you that you're in the far country, that you're stuck in the muck of your filthy sins. When people look at you, it looks like you've got it all together. You're fairly clean. But my friend, still, in your heart, you know you are far from God. Outwardly, you may look okay. But inwardly, when God looks, what does he see? He sees the state of your heart, which is filthy. Filthy to the core. You see, this story is for you, too. That's why I said at the start, this story is for all of us. For we are all prodigals in our hearts. And therefore, we must all repent. We must all leave the muck and the mud of our sin, be it external or be it internal. We are to turn our back on it and we are to give ourselves to God. And I want to urge you then that this is the night. Make the break tonight like the prodigal. Go to God just as you are and get right with him through his son, Jesus Christ. He came into this world to live the life of obedience that you and I can never live. And it was in love that he came to die the death of sinners that none of us here would even dare to die under the wrath of God. And please know that God is a gracious Father. That he is abundant in grace and favour towards sinners like you and me. He will receive you with open arms if you come in repentance and faith. There is forgiveness with the Lord. My friend, the present, right now, is the only time really that you have. The past is wasted. The past is gone. The future of tomorrow may never come. Now's the only time that any of us can be certain about. And so I would urge you to delay no longer, but to go to him just as you are. There's no ceremony. There's no more hoops to jump through. You know you're a sinner. You understand that God is full of grace and that you must confess your sin, you must turn from your sin, you can trust in Him to forgive you of your sin through what He has done through His Son on the cross on your behalf. And so now, what will you do? Whoever conceals his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes will have mercy. Proverbs 28, 13. May there be many and experience that mercy of God tonight. Let's pray. Oh, our Father, we thank you for the free offer of the gospel, for the free grace of God, Thank you that there's not some thing that we have to do to achieve some standard by which we will be ready to be saved. But rather, Lord, to be those that call out, Lord, save me. Lord, help my unbelief. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Bless your word, Lord, to each of us and to those of us who are saved. We think, Lord, what you've saved us from. We think, Lord, of how glorious has been your work in our lives. And we plead with you that you would continue that work in others, that you might be glorified. 
We pray now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.